main sanctuary. So we did this last year and you can um, see it online on Facebook Live. Or this year we're adding a second option which is come and sit in the space um, of the main sanctuary. Just some time to be in quiet prayer. If you would like to come, it will be open. Not a formal service at all, so you could slip in and out as you need to, but it does begin at 6 p.m. and that is each Monday. On Tuesday, the 14th, we're going to have ukulele lessons. So, <laughs> really excited about this. So if you have a ukulele, you can bring it. If you have never picked up a ukulele, that too is okay. You can come and they have ukuleles. It's going to be um, a love offering donation. Um, but it's someone in the community who has a set of ukuleles who will bring and teach us Christmas songs. So it might be completely awful music, but it is going to be completely fun fellowship. So um, no experience required. Come out and join us um, Tuesday um, at 6.30, 6.30 on the 14th. Um, also, one order of business. So, the Boy Scouts of America are restructuring after their lawsuit, and so we have to do some work here because we have sponsored troops. Um, so, there will be a Zoom call for Charge Conference, which is a Metro District Zoom call, but we have to vote on how we want to uh, place our vote as a charter organization for their restructuring plan. All the information for that will actually happen during the Zoom call, and it is Sunday the 5th at 4 p.m., and there is a link in your email so you can hop on um, that. But I don't have a ton of information, so if you have very specific questions, I might have to refer you to someone else, but I do hope that everyone who is interested in the restructuring of the Boy Scouts of America will join us on that Zoom call because that will determine how we vote as a church for the for what happens next. Not voting to keep them or not, but how we get to place our vote, if that makes any sense, or maybe not. So, with all of that business and fun, I invite you to stand as we prepare our hearts for worship. Holy and loving Lord, we give you thanks for this day in which we come to celebrate and to worship. We give you thanks for this beautiful season of Advent. And Lord, as we come to worship, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us, that you would calm our hearts and our minds, so that all we do in these moments will bring you honor, glory, and praise. Amen. Good morning.
Lord of hope, Lord of love, we wait for you this Advent season. Come, we pray, and fill our hearts with longing for your birth.
Let your glory reign, shining like the day, King of heaven, come. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to pray this morning, we have these names on the prayer list. Shirley Hickok, who's recovering from surgery, and Evelyn Potter, who is in radiation right now, Ann Cook, who is at, uh, she's in Harrisburg. Pruitt, I'll get there. This old brain doesn't work sometimes, so. Gary's sitting right back there, but he was in the hospital at the beginning of this week, and we remember him, and. Bob Chertok, we remember him. We remember Christy Horgan. She's lost three friends of hers that are, her, are right at her age in the last uh, short bit. And one of those was Jonathan Anderson, who died this week, and we remember his family. And also we remember Kathy Dreyer, who is fighting cancer. Let us bow. Oh, as we come to pray during Advent, uh, these my thoughts have been guided by different psalms that offer us a chance to wait. And so today's uh, verse for me comes from the 130th Psalm. The psalmist says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. Let us pray. Oh God, as we enter this season of waiting, of expectation, of hope, we sing of the wonder of your love, the joy of your presence in our world and in our lives, and the blessing of your yearning to be in a relationship with your creation. Help us as we wait. Help us to listen for your voice, to be attentive to the needs of others, to be aware of those who are struggling with brokenness, to be sensitive to the weariness that fills people's lives. We give thanks for people who have responded to your call, for Michelangelo who didn't say, I don't do ceilings, for a German monk named Luther who didn't say, I don't do doors. For an Oxford Don named John Wesley who didn't say, I don't do fields. For Moses who didn't say, I don't do rivers. For Noah who didn't say, I don't do arcs. For Mary Magdalene who didn't say, I don't do feet. For Paul who didn't say, I don't do letters. For Jesus, who didn't say, I don't do crosses. For Mary, who didn't say, I don't do babies. Oh God, impress upon us the need to be patient as we make our way through Advent. Shake us out of the doldrums of complacency that have settled around us in the pandemic. Stir our hearts and minds so that we are your messengers, your angels of peace and love this Advent season, telling the story of Jesus. We pray for our world, racked with violence, bombs and bullets disrupting life. We pray for our world, filled with fear, people who are angry or hiding, a new strain of COVID. We pray for our world struggling with prejudice. It's easy to see people as objects. We pray for our world burdened with weariness, medical personnel, teachers and students. We pray for our world yearning with a desperate need for love lonely people, sad people, hurting people, broken people, 
lost people. We pray for those who are dealing with health issues, especially Shirley and Evelyn and Ann and Gary and Bob and Christy and Kathy. Surround the Anderson family with your strength and patience and comfort. We pray for those who have experienced a first holiday without a loved one, especially the Overcash family, Patty, Don, Roger, the Kozeki family, the Johnson family, the Locklear family, the Coley family, the Gordon family, the Wells family, the Boss family, the Hendry family, the Nesbitt family, and Anne. We are bold to offer our prayers spoken and silent in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. My name's Douglas Carl. I've been a member of Curve Street Methodist for over 25 years. Of course, we've shut down and merged with Forest Hill, so I'm a member there now. Uh, we've been doing this for 13 years, like I said, and we've had lots and lots of blessings along the way. So the Open Heart Community Supper started about 13 years ago. Uh, Pastor Jim Hood and I decided that we should feed the community says it plainly in the Bible uh, so we started it we started it every other week at the beginning uh, then the five, the second year we did a uh, feeding of the 5,000 so we wanted to do 5,000 meals in one year and we did do that and we we're up to about 50,000 meals since then we also have had lots of people come through have helped in the kitchen and have helped on the outside the people that have been here needing a meal will help you if you ask and let them and, I, and I've always been one that if a person wants to help I want to let them help because if they feel like they're doing something it makes them feel good and it makes me feel good it's a blessing on both sides so we have been blessed in many different ways uh, some of them I've most one the biggest one that I remember is praying for people uh, sometimes you get people that don't actually need a meal but they're here for fellowship and I have prayed with different people and one particular guy I'll never forget he, he used to come he used to do yard work and he rolls in and he has one leg cut off and he tells me it could have been worse and I'm looking at him how could it be worse and he said they could have cut two off so he was telling me that he was trying to get a new leg prosthetic and so we prayed for him that night a group of us we all laid hands on him and six months later he comes in and throws his hands up he's walking and says it was y'all's prayer that did it so prayer is a mighty thing uh, i've had several other ones I had a lady with a cat I prayed for her to be able to take care of her cat but it, it meant so much for her and then the last one is a guy he uh i met him 10, 15 years ago in Tent City, and he was actually swept the dirt out at these camps and that. And now he's in a home. So he's made it all the way from homeless into a home, and he's now also wanting to donate to the soup kitchen to help. scripture this morning comes from the book of Matthew in the second chapter verses 1 through 12. 
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose ahead of them rose ahead until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, and on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So when I was growing up, I was really easy to buy a gift for. But as I've gotten older, I've kind of become those people that's hard to buy a gift for now. I've reached that point where if I need something, I'm going to pull out my phone and order it on Amazon, or I'm going to go to the store. There's no point in waiting a month for somebody to give it to me. I'll just buy it. So I'm at that point where I am able to do that. Um, and every year, I know what it's like for people like me now when I try to figure out what to give them. For people who have everything they need, um, sometimes, you know, I figure out things that are fun. Sometimes I think of things that are practical um, that I know they'll use. And to be honest, if I'm thinking about my parents or my grandparents, it always includes the three gifts of bird seed, suet, and turtles, the little chocolate pecans. These aren't necessities. They aren't anything that my parents or grandparents can't get on their own. Uh, and now I am like them. So I am blessed to be able to buy the things that I want, and I don't necessarily wait till Christmas or my birthday to buy them. And so my gifts have become similar as well. And so the question is, what do you do for people who have everything they need and who you don't know what to get them for? Or you don't want to do something that's just a money swap. Here's a $20 gift, and they give you a $20 gift back. And so thinking about that and that problem, I'm reminded a lot of the story of the Magi. So they see this wondrous sign that's pointing to where Jesus is, and the Magi call him the king of the Jews, and they call it his star. I imagine the Magi wrestled with the same gift-giving business. What do you bring to celebrate the birth of a king? one who presumably has all that they need, and how do you bring something that can top a star? Like you have a star, his star. So how do you top that? Or even bigger, what do you bring to Emmanuel, which means God with us? This has literally got bird seed, suet, and turtles. Like, I imagine the wise men were in that same predicament. So we don't really know much about what Joseph and Mary uh, and Jesus did with the gifts uh, after they received them. Uh, some say that they were symbolic gifts meant to foretell of Jesus' life and ministry. Uh, some say they were practical gifts. Uh, but the one thing that we do know about Jesus and gifts is that Jesus spent most of his ministry um, preaching good news for the poor, reaching out to the oppressed and the outcast. And later in Matthew's Gospel, he says this. He says that if you want to be complete... Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. So much of Jesus' earthly ministry was spent in mission. And so this Christmas, as you ponder what you can give instead of birdseed, suet, and turtles, consider a gift that might support missions. In the narthex, as you head to Sunday school, you'll find a table. There's also a table in here um, with alternative giving on it. And alternative giving is a way that we can give a gift this Christmas season to missions in honor of someone that we love. And so on the table, there are brochures that list many different ministries, like our Tuesday night meal. It has cards that you can give, and it also has a 
fancy, one-of-a-kind, handmade ornament by our senior pastor, Mandy Jones. So when you give a gift of mission, you can also give a gift of a handmade ornament this Christmas season. And so there are, I know, wow, I heard that, yeah. <laughs> so what do you give to somebody who has a passion for feeding the poor? Well, you can give a mission honor to Tuesday night meals. What about somebody who values supportive services for senior citizens? You can give a gift of mission and support the Coltrane Life Center. Thinking about all those things on your list, start thinking about the ways that you might give a gift of mission this year. Alternative giving is one of the ways that we can support the mission of Jesus, but it isn't the only way that we as the church do that. Remember your tithes and your offerings to Forest Hill also further the mission of the church throughout the entire year. And through your tithes and your offerings, we respond to all that God has given us with thanks. And all that we do with that reaches out into the world. So may we give with grateful hearts, responding not only to the way that God has blessed us, but also as a response to Jesus' earthly ministry and the mission of the church in the world. To show a hurting world that they have worth and they have value. To remind others that they aren't forgotten. And to be a light in places where some only see darkness. To reach out in love. May we give with grateful and generous hearts. And I invite you to stand and join us in singing, O oh, Come All Ye Faithful.
seated. scripture this morning comes from Luke 21 verses 25 through 34. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth distress among the nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up, raise up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And then Jesus told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you will know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not cut, catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole world, on the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all of these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Let us pray. Holy Lord, we give you thanks for this, your word. We give you thanks for this opportunity to center our hearts and our minds on you. And Lord, we pray that in these moments, you may speak deeply to our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit and your word. All this we pray and ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So has anybody wished you a Merry Christmas this year? It's beginning to happen. So Doug Call, who actually we saw him on the video, he stopped into the office a few weeks ago, and as long as I have known him, no matter what season of the year it is, he says Merry Christmas. And I just kind of go along with him. Oh, that's really weird. It's July, and you're like, Merry Christmas. And I'm like, oh, okay. But he explained it to me when he stopped by the office. You see, he says that when he wishes people a Merry Christmas, many times it takes them off guard. And even in the middle of the summer, when he says Merry Christmas, someone will say, Happy New Year. And that gives him an opportunity to say, no, that's not the response that we should have to Merry Christmas, even though society has trained us to say Happy New Year. As Christians, we should say Happy Easter, because you can't have Easter without Christmas. And so that's something for you to think about. And if you see Doug and he says, Merry Christmas, you can just reply, Happy New Year. And he, or not Happy New Year, don't reply that. <laughs> reply, see, even I'm doing it. You can reply, Happy Easter, and he will be so excited. And it is true. As followers of Christ, there are two high and holy days. Um, it's Christmas, the birth of Christ, and Easter, the resurrection of Christ. They anchor our faith and our traditions. And both of them have liturgical seasons before them. Advent is the four weeks before Christmas, and so we are beginning Advent today. Lent is the 40 days, not including Sundays before Easter. These seasons before our high and holy days are seasons for us to reflect, 
to prepare our hearts and our minds to fully experience the goodness and gravity of Christmas and Easter. Advent is much more than a countdown to Christmas. If you have gotten an Advent calendar, sometimes we think of that as how many days are left until Christmas. But really and truly, Advent is its own special season of preparation and anticipation. And when we understand that about this particular season, how it's meant to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, this passage from Luke on the first Sunday of Advent doesn't seem quite so odd. Because if perhaps when I began to read this passage, you might have thought, Mandy, don't you know that Christmas is coming? This is a weird, hard passage. But if we know that we are called to be waiting and expecting in the season of Advent, it's a little less odd. The beginning of this passage, it kind of shocks us. It may even pull our mind to an idea of rapture. Rapture is a theory that originated in the 19th century. It's been propagated by evangelical Protestants, pr primarily in the United States. And it was um, solidified later in the Left Behind series of the 1990s and early 2000s. And it plays on fear. Rapture is not a theological concept of the historic church. It's not an accepted uh, theology in mainline Protestant denominations, including United Methodist. And I say all of that to say that our worldview and our society influence how we hear this scripture. We hear this scripture very differently than those in Jesus' time. The people of Jesus' time, they looked for signs. Signs in the sky that would predict a change in the empire or a kingdom. Remember those wise men, the ones we just heard the scripture of this morning? They were looking to the sky for a sign. And when they saw the sign, they went looking for a new king. I don't think that Jesus was giving us a literal interpretation of what to look for. We know that there have been signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on earth for all of creation. The prophets spoke of these signs before Jesus, and many, many people have used their interpretations of such signs to signal the end of the world. And all of those predictions, all of them, have been completely wrong. What if Jesus was calling us to be present instead of predicting what would happen? Calling our attention to what is happening at this very moment to see the hurts of the world, to point out the brokenness of life, to show the rawness of the world in which we live, the bad news of reality, for which the good news of the kingdom of God is hope. Jesus says, look at the fig tree, another metaphor that his listeners would have understood. When the, figs be when the leaves begin to sprout, summer is near. As if to say, look for the signs of hope and you will know that the kingdom of God is near. What if this is not a scripture about fear, but a scripture that calls us to drawing our attention to this present moment to see that there are glimmers of hope in the midst of the brokenness and hardness of the world. Being present is a way that we focus our attention in this moment. So I've been, lose, I've been trying to lose a few pounds. Anybody in the boat with me? Discovered something. Pounds are much easier to find than they are to lose. I think it's the only thing in my life that I can't seem to lose. One of the strategies is to focus on what you're eating in this moment, to put away the distractions so you can concentrate on what is happening, that your mind and your body are fully aware that you are enjoying a nice meal. The opposite of that is fog eating. And so when you're fog eating, you're not paying attention and you're just eating, you know, that's what you do with the potato chips in front of the TV, or am I just the only one? You just keep putting it in. It's like you're fog eating. You're not thinking about what is happening. You're not present in that moment. 
In the same ways, many times we have fog living, not being present in the moment, just going from day to day to day, sometimes being stuck in the past or stuck dreaming about the future. But we are called to alertness in this passage. This season of Advent is calling our focus to what is here before us, not getting so far in the future that we're celebrating Christmas, but that we're standing in this moment of Advent, that we're looking in the world and we're saying this world is broken and yet there is hope. That Jesus comes into the world, breaks into the world to bring hope and joy, love and peace. This is the season to wait and prepare, to refuse to get so caught up in the trappings of the holiday that we miss this beautiful season of spiritual preparation that we so badly need. We need it because it renews our hope. It's the call back to focusing on what is really happening in the scope of eternity. This time of year, our our focus usually does shift. It moves from the regular rhythms of life to figuring out how to have enough time to see all the people that we want to share this season with. It focuses on um, what everyone wants on our Christmas list that we can put a bow on and place under the tree. It calls us to focusing on the logical preparations of the season. We desire to see lights and tinsel, to find places of comfort and joy and laughter. And if we're not careful, we can get so focused on what we want that we miss again what is actually happening. That we are living in this in-between time. A time when the kingdom of God has broken in our world with the birth of Christ, and yet the completeness of God is not yet fully seen. A time when our present reality is set in the brokenness of the world. People are hungry. Lives are devastated by unjust rulers and empires. Seas are rising. Families are broken. Humanity is hurting. And yet, there is hope. Hope that a new day is dawning that the leaves on the fig tree are sprouting, that God's kingdom is at hand, if only in part. And just as Jesus broke into our world, Jesus continues to empower us to be the hands and the feet of Christ to usher in the kingdom of God through the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls us to look up to be alert, to live in the present, to look for the signs of God's kingdom, a kingdom that brings hope. We are Advent people, people who are asked to watch and to wait, to focus on what is important instead of being distracted by the world, to remember that we do know the amazing love of God that we have received in Jesus Christ, and yet... We are waiting for the return of Jesus to experience the fullness of God's kingdom, a kingdom that brings joy and peace, that banishes fear and pain. This time of waiting, we are called to be faithful, to allow the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ to wash over us, to allow the Holy Spirit to mold our hearts and to work for glimpses of the kingdom of God on earth. So in our waiting and our watching, in our prayers prayers and praising, our hope is renewed. May we step into this beautiful season of Advent, not rushing to get to Christmas, but stepping into this moment to renew our hope as we focus our hearts on what God is doing in this in-between time, this time where we see glimpses of God's kingdom where we are allowed to be part of that, where we don't rush to all things being tidied and wrapped with a bow, but we sit in the hard places, because in those hard places of reality, God's kingdom is breaking in. And those places, when we look for them, they grant us hope. Let us pray. 
Lord, we are thankful that there are so many places that you bring about hope in our lives. We are so thankful for this season of watching and waiting, of preparing our hearts. And Lord, don't let us waste it away by jumping to the next thing. But Lord, call us to the present. Even if being in the present means we sit in the brokenness, for Lord, we know in the brokenness you give us life and hope. You renew our joy and you grant us peace. All this, Lord, we pray and ask in your holy name. Amen. Will you please stand and join us in singing? Now by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you 
and remain with you this very moment and forever. Amen.